Blessed are those you chose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome deeds of righteousness, O God our Saviour, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. Those living far away fear your wonders, where morning dawns and evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You care for the land and water it, we enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with corn, for so you have ordained it. You drench the, its furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. You crown the year with your bounty and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the desert overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks and the valleys are mantled with corn. They shout for joy and sing. When I read that, makes you think, doesn't it? We take everything for granted, it's always there. And we ne do we ever think back, really, to when God created it, you know? Uh, you just can't take it in, your mind won't take it, that he created all these things and they weren't there before. And I think, well, I do, you just get up and you take everything for granted and it's always there, it's always been there, and as far as you're concerned, it probably always will. But... Well, I'm talking to myself, I'm not preaching to you, I'm either preaching to you. <laughs> but that's what struck me as I read it, you know. Sorry about that. No, no, that's read, read to us. And uh, there's no projection as far as I'm aware, so uh, we'll just have to closely look at that uh, psalm together and see what it has to say to us. Because it is a psalm where... <coughs> Creation joyfully celebrates, joyfully sings. And when we think about creation, the wonder <coughs> of creation, and uh, I was going to say even the changing seasons that have a, a distinct dilemma about them, particularly uh, for many parts of the world. You know, when you think we've had, what, 40 degree heat waves this, this year, and it's created what an early harvest i don't know about you but some of the stuff that i put in the ground uh was just being harvested much earlier than anticipated and even my run of beans were wonky and <laughs> thick and uh, i'm always convinced that anyone can grow run of beans uh and mine are usually nice and long um, but they were just a, a disaster zone and that is replicated in different ways, isn't it? They're saying in the supermarkets that uh, you've just got to get used to wonky vegetables a little bit more because uh, some of the supermarkets are prepared to take them from the farmers and thankfully they do uh, and, and that helps. But there, there is a, a, a crisis, isn't there? And uh, a, a crisis that has been ignited, yes, by uh, COVID is a crisis that's been further ignited by the Ukraine conflict and the, the price and the availability of grain to feed the world. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, Ukraine uh, supplies 12% of global wheat, that is a huge percentage. And thankfully, it is being moved and moving out to just those areas of the world that are in particular need in Africa and other countries. And so there is a, a struggle. There is a sacrifice of so many. Uh, we've heard of floods that have devastated places like uh, Pakistan, let alone uh, Hurricane Ian, what it was it last week? Uh, how it went through Florida and Cuba, and with all its destructive powers. A uh, colleague of mine, uh, I came down to Bromham uh, to kind of retire, and he went off to the Cayman Islands to retire. <laughs> Not quite retire, he uh, heads up the First Baptist Church in Cayman Islands, and he, he, he was saying, hey, we're, we're just very fearful of this Hurricane Ian that was, could devastate the island. 
unfortunately, it still sort of missed the island a little bit, and uh, the devastation was, though, elsewhere. But people live with fears, don't they? And uncertainties. And it is as we come on this day of harvest thanksgiving that we, we offer our thanks to God. And into that thanksgiving there is that trust that we place in Him. And out of that comes a giving's heart and spirit and a gratitude <clears throat> that doesn't seek to take stuff for granted. You know how if you've had children and or grandchildren, uh, often the sort of statement is, remember to say thank you. Uh, remember to say thank you. And there, there is that encouragement to say thank you in all arenas of life. Not only in terms of the, the food that is kind of on our table, but just a sense of thanksgiving to the people that seek to serve us in different capacities, whatever it might be, whether it is a shopkeeper or someone else that you just happen to bump into, thanksgiving goes a long way. And it is Jesus who said uh, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And uh, that's taken up in Acts 20 verse 35, more blessed to give than to, to receive. And it is as we look at Psalm 65 that the, the first few verses celebrate the grace of God. Oh, how thankful we are for the grace of God that meets us in our need. Where would we be without the grace of God this morning? And to celebrate the, the, the grace of God. And certainly Jewish worshippers uh, had many a celebration, many a festival in their calendar that was linked to the land. And some of you, I'm sure, know those celebrations very well. Take, for instance, the celebration of Tabernacles. It was a great harvest festival occasion. And uh, just eight days of celebration, not just uh, one service of celebration, eight days of celebration, Thanksgiving for the year's crops. And uh, it's a celebration that came out of that wilderness wandering and suddenly finding that the land produced a harvest uh, that they were in. And uh, so they celebrated God's provision. We praise you for all that is past and thank you for all that is to come, as the hymn writer says. And it's all down to the amazing grace of God. And so the psalmist comes and says, Praise awaits you, O God, in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. Zion, the tabernacle, reference to the tabernacle or the temple, the gathering of God's people. And here they come together and there's that celebration of praise, that celebration of affirming trust in the, the God who's over all and in all. And uh, just says praise awaits you. Uh, so some translations speak about silence and, and the word is kind of connected to, to silence, a similar word to silence. When we come to a holy God, we stand in awe of our God. And that sense of silence, as we are those that are to be still and to know that I am God. And so here the psalmist comes and says, God, you deserve praise. It's a, it is our joy to delight ourselves in you. And, it, and this praise just affirms our own love, our own trust, our own confidence. It says, hey, my vows will be fulfilled. I am faithful. I'm seeking to express my commitment to, to you. Even this day, as we gather together, praise awaits you as God's people meet in his name. And so celebrate grace because you hear my prayers. There in verse 2, 
O oh, you who hear prayer, to you all men will come. <coughs> you, you, I'm sure you've known something of a favour of God's grace in answering prayer. And uh, that, that's part of sharing together and actually praying together, but also coming and celebrating those answers to prayer as well. That nothing is outside of the boundary of his care and concern for us. We are not left alone, but he is with us. He hears our prayer, our heart cry. And he is able to do, yes, immeasurably more than all that we ask or think or even imagine. So we celebrate grace, for, he, for you hear my prayer. Celebrate grace, for you forgive my sin. How essential that is there in verse 3. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. The thankful <coughs> for the cross and the power of the cross, the reconciling power of the cross to deal with our sin. And to set us free and to enable us to be cleansed and made whole. There's a well known atheist, uh, Margarita Lasky, who made an amazing confession on television many years ago. And she said something like this What I envy most about you Christians is your forgiveness. She added, rather sadly, I have no one to forgive me. And forgiveness lies right at the heart of our relationship. Cleanse me from my sin, Lord. Put your power within, Lord. Take me as I am, Lord, and make me your holy thine. And so Jesus is the one who can deal with our sin. He can bring forgiveness and cleansing and wholeness. And he takes our sin and places it as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered anymore. Isn't that glorious? And uh, more than that, celebrate grace for you welcome me into your presence. There in verse 4. I'm just reading through these verses and seeking to highlight that sense of affirming celebration in this first section in the grace of God because he is the presence of the Lord who is with us blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts we are filled with the good things of your house and your holy temple Oh, it's the Lord's presence where there is fullness of joy. It's the Lord's presence where there are pleasures forevermore. And here the, the psalmist comes and he, he, he just knows the, the reality of those tangible terms when he experiences God's presence. And with that presence there is the ongoing expression of his peace that fills the heart and the mind, even in the midst of the storm, whatever that might be. And, and yes, this verse, verse 4, comes and says, celebrate grace for you fill me with abundant goodness. Uh, every good and perfect gift, says James, is from above, coming down from the, the, the Father of unchanging spirit that ever reaches out to us. And uh, so we come and uh, simply affirm that God is good. As the Africans used to sing, we used to have a bunch of Africans in, in our church, and uh, they, they would have that very simple song, God is good all the time, God is good all the time. Once they went for it, they really went for it. And they expressed that sense of response to, to a God who is good all the time. And so here is the sovereignty of God that is over things and in all things. How we need to know that in a rapidly changing, uncertain world, to know our dependence can be <coughs> upon him. And on this harvest Thanksgiving day, we celebrate 
the grace of God. He's given us so much. He gives us so much. We sit and we worship here today, just overflowing with a sense of the wonder of knowing this is our God. And his grace reaches out to us to wrap itself around us and embrace us and make us whole. The next section of uh, verses from 5 to 8 come and celebrate the greatness of God. It, it, you have it. God is great and he's, he's just powerfully at work in creation itself. He told elsewhere that he upholds the world by the word of his power. And the call here is to celebrate greatness for you fill me with hope. There in verse 5, just a lovely thought. You answer us with awesome deeds of righteousness, O God our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the forest seas. <coughs> hope is not just positive thinking. Hope is not simply optimis optimism. It, it is Far more than that. But the one thing that we do know is that hope is in short supply, isn't it? Where, where does our hope lie? Does it lie in politicians? Uh, I say no more. Uh, does it lie in business life and the fluctuating stock markets and all that is transpiring in the midst of uh, the, the, the banking world? But our hope is centered in the God of all hope. And that hope is the very anchor of our soul. It holds us in the face of any storm that might come. And enables us to be rooted in the unchanging promises of God's word. Here, here is a book of unchanging promises. 8,000 promises plus, and, and they're promises that can be utterly depended upon. I remember hearing of an elderly lady, she had a well-worn Bible, and looking at the Bible, someone noticed that in the margin there was a P. Uh, turning over the page, another P. Uh, turning over another page, P and P. And just intrigued as to what the... the the, the letters meant for her. And she simply said, well, that's a promise. And the P plus P is a promise that has been proved. And, and I'm sure you, you can look at the, the scriptures as you read them. You know there are times when a certain promise has come to you. And it's been a lifeline. It has been that which has held you and kept you. And, and you've just held on to it in the midst of a particular, perhaps, episode in your life. And it was the word of life. It was the word of hope. Because it comes from the God who fills you with all hope. And in verse 6 to 7, I've simply put down in my notes here, celebrate greatness for you are the creator of all. And this is where we, we, we just think about the, the, the world and, and harvest ultimately. But here you form the mountains. The mountains speak of that which is immovable. I, I, I love going to the west coast of Scotland. I got there most years. Uh, partly because my, my parents came down from that region and so it must be in my DNA somewhere uh, that gravitates towards those, uh, those mountains, uh, granite rock mountains, solid mountains, immovable mountains. And there's something about just the sheer wonder of it at all. You form the, the mountains. And uh, all that is so much a part of, of the universe that we inhabit 
this galaxy that we call the Milky Way, uh, we're, we're told there's what's it, something like a hundred billion stars. I can't even begin to imagine what a hundred billion stars are in our galaxy, and our galaxy just happens to be one of a, 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 a thousand million galaxies. And, uh, you know, if you were to travel the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, which is pretty fast, you'd reach the sun in eight seconds, the edge of the Milky Way in 100,000 years, maybe the edge of the universe in 10 to 15 billion years. You've all heard of the Hubble telescope and all the divine handiwork that has been uh, displayed by some of the, the, the pictures that have been taken. It's now kind of superseded by the James Webb Telescope. This telescope that is hovering somewhere 932,000 miles above the Earth and bringing stunning images of the universe, of the galaxies and often discovering far more than they ever realized. This is our God. He, he, he's, he's the creator of all. And he, he's the one who's still the roaring of the seas, there in verse 7, the roaring of the waves, the turmoil of the nations. I, I, I do like the sea. One of the problems of living in Bedford, the sea is so far away. When I, I lived in Kent, we just would nip down the road uh, 15 minutes and you would be on, I was going to say, high seafront and uh, in, enjoying the, the, the sea. But we're aware of the uncontrollable nature of the sea, aren't we? As we, we've seen with the, the hurricanes of recent days, even this past week and also the turmoil of the nations. But one day the nations of this world will become the nations of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Remember the last, one of the last uh, harvest hymns we, we sang had, had a, a final verse concerning uh, the return of the Lord, didn't it? That's harvest, isn't it? The great harvest, the glorious harvest that ultimately is to be gathered in. One day there will be no sorrows, no sadness, no suffering, no sickness. In the glorious, expansive provision that God would hold for us in all eternity. And there in verse 8, celebrate greatness for you impart sustaining joy. This is just a lovely little verse. Those living far away, fear your wonders. Uh, and then it says, where morning dawns and the evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. Isn't that lovely? Just when morning dawns, the evening fades, there is a song of joy that continues to be echoed in one way. doesn't mean to say you're singing around the house uh, songs of joy necessarily, but it's that deep, settled joy because what is on our lips is actually what is stirring within our own hearts. And joy is the very heartbeat of heaven, even this day. And someone comes to another Lord, you know, the, the verses that Jesus himself used. Heaven celebrates, they have a party, they have a great banquet, food filling the tables. The image of celebration. And so there's just further celebration, the last section. And uh, with this, I uh, begin to bring things to a close. There in verse 9 to 13, celebrate the goodness of God. Not only celebrate the grace of God, not only celebrate the greatness of God, but celebrate the goodness of God. And I've already mentioned that God is good all the time. God's grace and power is just 
tangibly expressed through the harvest, isn't it? The provision that, that we see all around us. And it, it is just celebrating the abundance of God's provision. There in verse 9, you care, you enrich, you have ordained it. It's, it's, it's you at work, Lord. We acknowledge that. And there's abundant provision. In and through the ministry, particularly, say, of, of, of Jesus, you, you see just the abundance of provision, don't you? When he, he did some of the miracles. For instance, Peter is fishing and, uh, well, he's told to put the nets over for a, a catch of fish because they had caught nothing all night. And you remember how they, they put those nets over uh, the, the, the boats and caught such a large number of fish that their nets were breaking. Not just a few fish, but net, uh, fish that broke the nets. And Jesus fed the 5,000. There were 12 baskets of fragments left over. Uh, when Jesus turned water into wine, it wasn't just a, a few bottles of, of, of wine just to tied things over, it was 120 gallons of the stuff. There's abundant generosity with a God who's abundant in his love for us and his provision for us. You care for the land there in verse 9 and you water it. And the streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain. This is a sense of thanksgiving as the harvest has been gathered in. And you, you drench its furrows and you bless its crops. Yes, there are times, even in the scriptures, where we see God allowed famine to come. You, you remember Joseph's experience, famine was going to come across the land. And God allowed that famine over the land. But it also allows abundance to come in order to bless a people with that which they need and require. Verse 11 is a, a great harvest of thanksgiving verse, isn't it? You crown the year with your bounty and your carts overflow with abundance. As we sang earlier, we plant the fields and scatter the good seed on the land, but it is fed and watered by his almighty hand. And so there in verse 12, the grasslands of the desert overflow, the hills are clothed <clears throat> with gladness. Do you see the sense of celebration? Meadows are covered with flocks and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. And they, they, they have it. The, the, the wilderness, the barren ground, suddenly the rains come and <coughs> everything just instantly grows, as it were. And it's clothed with beauty. And it's clothed with bounty. And we come on this Thanksgiving day it affirms harvest. And we enter his gates with thanksgiving. As the psalmist says in Psalm 100, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I think it's a message, a paraphrase says, enter with the password, thank you. Enter with the password, thank you. Uh, I remember being with my one of my grandchildren, I've only got two, but they're the youngest, and we were out for a walk and came to a gate, and she ran ahead, and to enter the gate, you had to come up with some password. I wasn't quite sure what password to use, but it was just the game that they, they play. Uh, you can't get through unless you give the password. And, and here it's as though the Lord says, just remember, there is a password for the living of each day. And it's a thank you that rises to God. It's a thank you that moves out in gratitude to those around us. 
for the little things that are done together with the big things that are done for us in our daily walk of life. And so the grace of God, the goodness of uh, the greatness of God and the goodness of God, it just reverberates with the acknowledgement that God is a glorious God and we rest and rejoice in him this day, this harvest day filled with thanksgiving, filled with joy, filled with satisfaction, as we acknowledge him afresh in our hearts and say, Lord, may we never take you for granted, may we never take that which we have around us for granted, may we not take one another for granted. And so here is a harvest song that I leave with you so that indeed the Lord might receive our praise, our celebration, and our thanksgiving. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that the psalmist comes, and there is this overflow of thanksgiving, this overflow of gratitude for all your grace, for all your goodness, for all your greatness. And is displayed particularly in the, the fields that have been sown, the harvested, and the harvest that has been brought in. And Lord, we pray that we too might echo the ancient praise of your people in this psalm and truly depend upon you day by day and enter each day with that password. Thank you, ever echoing through our lips, to your glory and praise. Amen. Amen. Amen.